Hello, today we're going to talk about net ionic equations. So let's do a quick review how to balance equations first, because that's kind of the first step when you are doing a net ionic equation. Um, so let's start with an equation like CH4 plus O2 yields CO2 plus H2O. This is a combustion reaction because you're reacting um, a compound with O2 gas. Now, if you look at it right this moment, we've got one carbon atom, four hydrogen atoms, and two oxygen atoms on the reactant side on the left. And we have one carbon atom, two hydrogen atoms, and three oxygen atoms on the product side on the right. Um, so that's a problem. Like you can't make elements disappear or create them out of nothing. Um, unless you're doing a nuclear equation, which we're not, and it's not part of the AP uh, curriculum anyway. But, um, so the atoms have to match on either side. So um, I'm going to go ahead and use coefficients. Um, I need to multiply this by two, so I can change the uh, number of hydrogens. And the only way to do that is by putting a two in front of the whole compound. Now that's going to change both the number of hydrogens, hydrogens and oxygens. So I'm going to have now four hydrogens and um, let's see, one, two, three, four oxygens total on the product side. Um, so carbons and hydrogens are balanced, but we still need to figure out the oxygens. So I need to go ahead and add a coefficient here. Let's multiply this by two. That will change the number of oxygens to four. And now it is all balanced uh, because the atoms are the same number on either side of the equation. Um, a couple little hints, if you have um, polyatomic ions, um, I would keep those together as long as they're the same on both sides of the equation. Just treat them as one thing. It makes the balancing a lot um, quicker and easier. Um, and if you have like a really big um, organic compound, sometimes it's easier if you just go ahead and put a two in the front of the organic compound that you're combusting. And it, and it just makes the balancing go faster. And if you need to, you can always reduce it at the end. So if, for example, you wind up with um, you know, 2 CH4 plus 4 O2 yields 2 CO2 plus 4 um, H2O, all of those coefficients are all divisible by 2, and you need to make sure that you put the lowest ratio instead. Now let's look back at that um, combustion reaction, CH4 O2. You have CO2 and water, unless they otherwise tell you, you assume that it's at um, room temperature. Um, and then you want to include the states of matter whenever you can. So methane is a gas at room temperature, oxygen is a gas at room temperature, carbon dioxide is a gas at room temperature, and water is a liquid at room temperature. So G for gas, L for liquid, S would be for solid, and AQ would be for aqueous. Okay, so solids are going to be for um, compounds that are not soluble in water, whereas aqueous are for things that are soluble in water. A um, couple things, kind of general things that you should know um, for sure are gases. You need to know that you know hydrogen is a gas, nitrogen is a gas, oxygen is a gas, fluorine is a gas, uh, chlorine is a gas. You should know that CO2 is a gas. Are there any other gases that you should really know? Maybe NO2 and SO2, although those don't, don't show up all that often. Um, but those ones are all gases that you should kind of have an idea that they're gases at room temperature. Um, you should know that bromine is a liquid at room temperature. Water is a liquid at room temperature. Um, yeah, those are the big ones. Um, I2, iodine, the other halogen, is a solid at room temperature. So those are some gases, liquids, and solids that I recommend that you remember their states of matter. Let's review the solubility rules. Um, we have Shan 1, where we read it in reverse. Um, one refers to the group 1 metals. N refers to nitrates, which is NO3 negative. A refers to ammoniums which is NH4 plus, um, and acetates, C2H3O2. 
Um, H refers to halogens, or the group 7 uh, nonmetals. I'm sorry, group 17, really, uh, nonmetals. Uh, there are three exceptions to the halogens, uh, silver, lead, and mercury. And then S refers to sulfates, which are SO4, 2 negative. And there are six exceptions to the sulfates, um, silver, lead, mercury, calcium, strontium, and barium. Um, and so I call these rules because any Thing that is not on this list or anything that's an exception um, you will put a s for solid if it's not on the list if it is on the list then you will put a q for aqueous um, and and of course these are kind of guidelines the things that wind up solid there um, might dissolve a little bit but it's not significant enough for us to write our equations as they're dissolved. And we'll take a look at how this is useful in, um, in our examples. So you should also know the difference between strong and weak acids and bases. If an acid and or base is strong, it will completely dissociate. Uh, but if it's a weak acid or a weak base, it will um, partially dissociate. Partially dissociate. Only partially break down into ions. Now, um, for all acids and bases, you want to use the AQ, but you're only going to um, break apart the strong acids and strong bases into their ions because they completely dissociate. Now, the only way to get around this is to memorize our strong acids and our strong bases. And then if it's not on the list of strong things, then it must be weak. There are seven strong acids you need to know, um, HCl, HBr, and HI, um, HClO3, HClO4, HNO3, and H2SO4. Those are your seven strong acids. And I usually chunk it into these three, these two, and these two, just to help me remember those seven. The strong bases are a little easier to remember um, because you can use the periodic table. We have uh, lithium hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, rubidium hydroxide, and cesium hydroxide. Um, those are the group one metal hydroxides are strong. And then some of the group two ones are also strong. Calcium hydroxide, strontium hydroxide, and barium hydroxide. And I went ahead and wrote them like this because this is how they appear on the periodic table, um, just with hydroxides attached. So you need to memorize these seven strong acids and eight strong bases because those ones will completely dissociate when you're writing the net ionic equations. Okay, so let's go ahead and um, talk about the steps that we're going to use to do net ionic equations, and then we'll do some examples. So the first thing you want to do is you want to write the full equation, um, and you need to make sure that it is balanced and that you assign the correct states, and that includes using Shan 1 or your um, strong acid, strong base lists. Um, the second step, what you will do is you will separate all of the things that are aqueous or that are strong acids and bases. And by separate, I mean you're going to break them apart into the separate ions. And then our third step will be to eliminate what we call spectator ions. Spectator ions. Spectator ions are things that wind up exactly the same on our reactant side and our product side. They'll, they're still there in our reaction. They're still there in our beaker or wherever you're doing the reaction. But they're not changing. So they're not participating in the reaction. They're just spectators. And then once you eliminate the spectator ions, you're left with the net ionic equation. 
And that's why we call it net because it removes anything that is not changing. Okay, let's go ahead and do a couple examples um, following the steps in order. The net ionic equation for the reaction between lead to nitrate and sodium chloride. Um, the first thing you want to do is assign states to your reactants. Um, PbNO32, it's a nitrate. Nitrates don't have any exceptions, so that must be aqueous. It reacts with sodium chloride. It's a group one metal. Group of metals don't have any exceptions. It's aqueous. Then you want to use our patterns of reaction. Um, we can tell that this is a double replacement reaction because it has two compounds reacting. So the metals switch partners. Sodium is going to bind with the nitrate. We know sodium has a plus one charge. Chloride has a minus one charge. Nitrate, we know, also has a minus one charge. And since there are two of them, we know the lead must have a plus two charge in this case. So because lead has a plus two charge, we need to react it with um, two chlorines, PbCl2. So the negative one charge from the chlorine and the positive two charge from the lead. Um, the sodium nitrate, because it's a group one metal, has an aqueous and then chlorine is a halogen, but lead is one of the exceptions. So because of that, we're going to put an S for solid because it's an exception on our solubility rules. All right. Now that you have the um, correct reactants and products and the correct states, let's go ahead and balance the equation. Um, I need to put a 2 here because there's two chlorines on either side. And I also need to put a two here. So there, there's two sodiums and two nitrates on either side. And now it's completely balanced. So this is our full equation that's balanced and it has their states. That's kind of the first step. Second step, you're going to split apart into ions anything that is aqueous. So the lead two plus charge is aqueous. Um, subscripts become coefficients unless it's a polyatomic. So 2NO3 aqueous, 2 sodium chloride. Coefficients apply to all things in the compound. So there's also two chlorines there. There are two sodium ions on the product side, two nitrates on the product side. And the last thing here, the lead 2 chloride, does not split apart because it's a solid. PbCl2, it stays exactly the same. So this would be our full ionic equation. All of these things are ions. Now, the next thing we need to do is figure out what things are spectator ions. So sodium is exactly the same on both sides, and our nitrate ions are exactly the same on both sides. So those are our spectator ions for this reaction because they're not changing. You are going to eliminate those and just write the rest of our equation, the lead two ions and the chloride ions are reacting to form solid lead two chloride. And this is our net ionic equation. This is the goal. Let's do one more example. This time we're going to do an acid and base reaction. So we want to um, write out the reaction first. We have NaOH. Um, all acids and bases, you should put aqueous. So Hc2H3O2, it's aqueous. Now, um, this is still a double replacement reaction, so you're going to swap the metals. The H winds up with OH. Now, typically, we don't write it like that. Usually, we're going to write it like H2O. And water is a liquid at room temperature. And then the other thing that we're forming is going to be sodium acetate. Now, it's a group one metal. It's aqueous. Um, so anytime you have an acid and a base reacting, you're going to form water and some kind of salt. Um, let's go ahead and check to make sure that it's balanced. If um, one sodium on either side, 
we have the OH and H in water, that's good, and then we have the acetate ion is the same on both sides, so it's all balanced. Now um, that's our first step is done, we need to split apart anything that completely dissociates. So sodium hydroxide is on our list of strong bases. We need to go ahead and split that up into ions. But acetic acid is not on our list of strong acids. That means it must be a weak acid. So it's going to stay together on my reactant side. You still put the aqueous for weak acids and weak bases, but you just don't break it down into ions. Now on the product side, um, the water stays intact because it's a liquid. And then we have our salt, um, which is aqueous, so I want to go ahead and split that up into ions as well, sodium ion and our acetate ion. Now we need to look for spectator ions, anything that is exactly the same on both sides. Sodium is our spectator ion here, and so we will not write that in our final reaction. We have our hydroxide ions, our acetic acid forming water, and our acetate ions. And that's our nidionic equation.